If we want to deliver better software faster into production, that relies on us working in ways that allow us to know that our software is indeed better, but we also need to do that efficiently because we want to go faster. That's pretty obvious, I suppose, but it has some important consequences. These consequences, for example, rule out some ways of working that don't give us that fast, accurate, easy to achieve insight into the correctness of our work. The only way to be sure that we are being accurate is to evaluate exactly what we will release into production. Anything else and we're really just crossing our fingers for luck and guessing. Sometimes our guesses may be good ones, but they're still only guesses. So if you want to do better than guessing, we need to evaluate releasable units of software. Ideally, exactly the sequence of bytes that represents our system. And if all is good, we can release that exact sequence of bytes into production with no more effort or worry. Because we know it works because we've already tried it. This is what continuous integration and continuous delivery are all about. Evaluate the stuff that you will release and do it fast. But what does that mean if our system is composed of lots of pieces developed by different groups of people? How can we evaluate these pieces to a level where we can be confident that they work together without testing them all together? This is the microservice problem. This is the job of contract testing. And that's our topic for today. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if we enjoy the content today, hit like as well. If we aim to test what we release to the point where it is releasable without any more work, which is really what defines a deployment pipeline in continuous delivery, then the correct scope for a deployment pipeline must be an independently deployable unit of software. If our system is big, we'll want it to be built by lots of people in separate small teams because that's what works best. But now we have a big problem and there are only two real solutions to it, both a bit tricky. And one very common big mistake that seems less tricky until you think about it carefully. Let me pause at this moment and say thank you to our sponsors. We're very fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Tricentis, Transfic and Ice Panel. All of these companies offer products and services that are well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, please click on the links in the description and support our sponsors. Continuous delivery is working in a way so that our software is determined to be releasable at least once per day. The reason that small teams are important is that they can work more independently of one another, in parallel with one another, and so make far faster progress overall. It doesn't really help us much to break our development organisation into lots of small teams so that we can move faster and then organise work so that the only way that they can proceed is in lockstep with each other and so move slower. Often, many teams combined move, move slower than a single team would if they worked alone. So here is our problem. How can our small teams be decoupled from one another if one team can't tell if its code is releasable until it's been tested with code from other teams? And how can we get fast definitive feedback at least once per day on the releasability of our changes? The starting assumption that nearly everyone makes is that you must break the system into small parts, allowing separate small teams to own the separate small parts. This takes a variety of forms. The commonest, most traditional form is to divide by expertise. Let's have business teams, analysis teams, architecture teams, UI UX teams, dev teams, test teams, ops teams, and so on. This doesn't work well at all because we're all working in lockstep now. Whatever else is going on, this is a classic waterfall. Every feature needs to engage nearly everyone. So every feature comes with a big overhead. This is a highly coupled approach to development. The other common response is to have small teams and organize them by components, modules, or services of the overall system. The devil, though, is in the detail here. It really is down to how coupled these modules are to one another. So how we manage that coupling is key 
to how we can scale development with small teams. If part A depends on part B and part B depends on part C and D, whichever team we're in, how can we tell if our change is releasable? The common misstep here is so common, in fact, that it's probably the commonest way to organise teams these days, as far as I can tell, is to structure things so that each small team works in isolation, evaluating their changes locally, but that doesn't give them any insight into the validity of their changes in the context of the whole system. If I am working on team B and change something, I may break team A's work. Worse, if I'm working on team A and I change something that propagates down the chain and breaks C or D, then my change isn't releasable. But nothing local tells me about that. And I won't find out until somewhere everything's tested together. Even then, once the problem is detected, I now need to have access to see it, recognise it and be in a position to fix it. Worst of all worlds is that now what I do in response to identifying the problem is to raise a ticket and wait for the team responsible for the code that I broke to fix the problem that I forced on them with my change. This is another highly coupled approach to development. So now the whole process is moving forward really slowly. In continuous delivery terms, this is a monolithic system, however technically componentized it might be. Because we can't release it without testing all of the pieces together first. I talk about the strategies that work best in more detail in this video. Now, despite common misconceptions, there's nothing much wrong with this kind of monolith. It all depends on how you organize things and ultimately on the scope of evaluation. You can't have your microservices cake here and eat it too, though. You need to test independently deployable units of software. Without that, this monolithic approach is a very inefficient way for us to organize our work. Because not only have I got to evaluate everything together to get results at least once per day, to see if I broke anything anywhere else, but I also need access to everyone else's repos so that I can fix the problems that I introduce raise those damn tickets and wait for the end of time, or for all of the pieces to work together, whichever comes sooner. So we don't want to do that. So what does work? Well, we can either suck it up and treat the system as what it really is, a monolith, and evaluate everything together all of the time. We build and optimize a single fast, efficient deployment pipeline that can determine the releasability of our system quickly enough to sustain continuous delivery and use a shared repository and continuous integration for everyone's work and evaluate everything together after every commit. Actually, this works surprisingly well and is surprisingly scalable. Or, getting back to the main topic for today, we allow each team to determine the releasability of their changes independently of one another, without testing them with everyone else's changes before release. That's it. Those are the two choices that you have. You can mix and match these two approaches, but fundamentally, that's all that really works. And importantly, to my mind, the ideas at the root of both of these is about the scope of version control and evaluation of releasability. We need to scope these things to independently deployable units of software. Only then can our deployment pipelines be definitive for the deployment as they should be. The second option of breaking the whole system into small, focused, independently deployable units is the microservices strategy. And technically, your ability to do this is dependent really on two things. Good modular design with clear, well-defined interfaces between the pieces, which I talk about more in a more detail in this video, and contract testing, where we test our assumptions of those interfaces between the pieces. I have a free how-to guide about designing microservice-based systems, uh, and there's a link to that in the description below. Um, I've been speaking about contract testing as an approach for a long time now. And I generally recommend PACT as a tool to help uh, with contract testing, and it's good. But I recently saw a presentation introducing a nice-looking alternative called Specmatic. 
from an old friend, uh, Narish Jane. Maybe I should point out that I'm not being sponsored to say this, but I did get a t-shirt when I spoke at the conference that Naresh organized. Um, I've also not used this in a real production project so far, but I do like the look of it and I will try it myself given the need. I think Specmatic is addressing some real problems in an interesting way uh, that seems to me should work. Naresh pre presented this model uh, in his conference talk, which starts with, in the obvious place, I suppose, by designing the API for the service. We agree the contract between producers and consumers and specify this as a separate thing, using some form of interface description language or specification language. There are lots of off-the-shelf open source approaches to capturing those specifications of the contract between the pieces. Most of Specmatic's examples uh, are based on open API, uh, a YAML-based specification language. But also something that I liked was that you can define your own interface description language if the need arises, if you're doing something unusual perhaps. This is the contract which we now store in a central contract repository. Now we can compare different versions of the contract with each other to determine their compatibility using only the tools provided. We don't need to write any code uh, or extra tests for that. Specmatic does that for us. My impression is that this is a na rather analogous to verifying types in a typed language, but at the level of service APIs. We specify the type contract and then verify that the service is of the type defined or talking to the type defined by the contract. Specmatic does what they call contract contract compatibility tests. So if service A is using contract version 2 and service B is using contract version 3, the tools can verify if they can successfully communicate with, with one another um, by running these checks and verifying that the contracts are compatible with one another. You could run these checks in your deployment pipeline and you can then prevent merges of any broken contracts, non-backwards compatible versions of the contracts. So if I change the version that I'm publishing, I can find out at build time by checking the backward compatibility of my change with everybody else's use of previous versions of the contract if I want to. It's a little bit more complicated than this, but I think that thinking of these contracts explicitly as being similar to types may help. Let's think of a couple of scenarios. I'd like to know if my change breaks any consumers of my service. So at commit time in my deployment pipeline, I can run a test based on the Specmatic tools to see if the new version of the contract that I've just changed is backward compatible with the previous version. If not, the pipeline rejects the change. Now I'm forced to think again and decide what to do next. I could choose to make the contract backwards compatible. The Specmatic documentation offers some decent advice describing the kinds of chains that are backward compatible and the kinds that are not to help you to do this. Or I could decide to add the new breaking change and support this new interface in parallel with the old perhaps and communicate to consumers of the old version that I'd like them to upgrade when it's convenient for them to do so. If one of my consumers has su a suggestion for how they'd like the contract to change, they could create the new version of the contract, validate that it's backwards compatible, and maybe even start work on their use of the new version of the contract separate from me. They won't break anything, their code will keep working. Even as they add new features to take advantages of the proposed new contract, the risk that they're t consciously taking at this point is still only completely in their hands. If the service provider doesn't agree later to add the changes to support the new version of the contract, still nothing breaks, but the team that made the, took the risk may have wasted some of their time because they decided to take, that, take on that risk. I like this kind of decoupling between teams. It gives teams better opportunities to make progress more independently of one another. Each team can work to their own priorities independently of all of the others. And yes, there may be some costs if predictions don't work out. But that's always true. 
And actually, the consequences are much more serious if the teams grind to a halt because they're locked together. The big idea here is that we are, use shared specifications for the contracts. This is a modern take on an old idea, to be honest. Corba Idle and DCOM interfaces, for example, did much the same thing, and before then probably DCE. Actually, an interface in a typed language is also, as I said, really the same kind of thing. Specmatic adds a new take on this, though, and as a result, it's able to offer what they claim is a zero-code approach to contract testing for many, uh, even most, use cases. As long as you specify the contracts in a supported idle of some kind uh, and use these version control definitions as shared versions of the contract, they can automatically check compatibility generate contract tests, and generate contract testing stubs that will simulate an implementation of the contract so you can test your service against it. This works as a kind of smart mock and allows you to predefine your expectations of, the, of the, the contract. I'm usually a bit wary of the use of auto-generated tests, but in this case, for this task, given that you have a clear specification of your contracts defined in software somewhere, then validating adherence to those contracts is a significantly simpler task than general functional testing. And so, this all seems completely amenable to the use of automation to me. This does depend on defining the contracts and sticking to them. No sneaky backdoors, no sharing data via data stores, but hopefully you'd never do that anyway. The documentation for Specmatic mostly uses OpenAPI for the contract, as I mentioned. But I'm told that you can also write plugins to support your own form of contracts if you're doing something more unusual. I'm not entirely sure about the reality of that, to be honest. All of the examples that I've read so far pretty much assume the use of web protocols, which is what most people use. So I don't know how far the tools go to help you if you're doing something really esoteric. Again, as I said, I haven't found time to apply this for myself yet. And I don't usually recommend ideas or technology that I haven't tried personally. But this approach looks really intriguing to me. I can imagine this going further too, opening the door to the Specmatic developers adding more support for other patterns of use. Uh, in helping us facilitate the coordination of work between teams without increasing the coupling between them. Maybe some stuff that helps to manage the parallel use of deprecated APIs, for example. I do want to try this for myself, but I didn't want to wait for me to do that before mentioning this intriguing idea here. I'll report back when I find time to try it out properly. But if you find this one useful, or perhaps if you find it problematic, let me know in the comments below. Of course, there are links to the spe Specmatic in the notes for, the, for this episode too. Thank you very much for watching, and if you enjoy our stuff on the Continuous Delivery channel, please consider supporting our work and joining our Patreon community. Thank you, and bye-bye.